Okay. Next up is Voices of Change with your hosts, Leslie Acosta and Isa Richardson. Voices of Change is to connect, inform, and empower people to engage in social political change. Right here on Usula Radio. World news, local politics, saving money and investing, all this and more right here on Usula Radio. Your voice, your radio. Welcome to Voices of Change. I am Aisha Richardson, your co-host with Leslie Acosta, talking about issues that are of concern to folks across our region. And today's show is Race in America. And we're delighted to have a guest, Tyler Perry. A Ty- mm, I'm sorry, Tyler Ray. <laughs> so um, so we're, we're, we're never talking about some heavy stuff, but, you know, we, we really, you know, we have to be able to keep ourselves together as we're talking about heavy things. Um, Tyler is um, a dynamic young man. He is um, a graduate of community college and he is in Tem- at Temple University right now. Um, he is the um, head of the, G- the North Philadelphia GOP and he is the ward leader in the 16th ward, which is a very dynamic ward with Temple University, with, um, um, you know, with uh, business corridors, the 22nd and the, uh, Susquehanna Business Corridor, the Broad Street Business Corridor, that all need some help, some assistance, and have been lagging probably since the last riots that happened in Philadelphia in the 1960s. And so Tyler identified issues in his community that he's concerned about, and he is working to change them. And so we're delighted to have you come on to Voices of Change because that's what Voices of Change is about. It's about identifying issues, identifying problems, talking about them, and then seeking solutions. So welcome, Tyler. So what's going on? What, what, what are the things that you've been seeing in your neighborhood that you want to make sure that there's change? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you for having me on. The major concern that I see in my neighborhood is definitely gentrification and displacement of neighbors. Um, as you know, like you said before, we live in an area that's also mixed with Temple University. Mm-hmm. And Relations have been good, relationships have been bad. It's all, you know, 50-50. But I definitely see that there's a major issue when you have private developers, not necessarily from Temple University. There's a misconception that Temple University is purposely kicking out neighbors. That's not true. You have private developers and private development companies that are coming in, flipping houses, actually buying houses for way below market value, selling them and flipping them. And they're not for anyone in the neighborhood or anyone in the community. So that's one of my major concerns. I always, I'm always against, uh, I wanna be more for neighborhoods and neighbors owning their properties. So therefore they can leave something for the future generations instead of us being right now. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a big problem in the, um, in the 16th Ward in particular, particularly because of the, um, the rise, the way that Temple University switched its plan as a commuter college to a, um, a college where they wanted residents and and they wanted their students to be living on campus, but they didn't plan for the housing, which then led to developers coming along in North Philadelphia and uh, purchasing property at low rates and um, rehabbing them and putting students in. And then you have this, you know, large population of young people next to populations of older people and then, um, the, and then the young people are renters, so they're not really interested in taking care of the property. And then they see the neighborhood as a quote unquote ghetto. So they don't think that the neighbors are taking care of the property. However, um, they are, but uh, there's, there's been a lot of tension between students and neighbors in that, in that area. And Temple has done a, um, 
uh, a reopen plan and they're they're bringing their students back so that tension between the neighbors and the um and temple students coming in is is probably going to be ramping up so uh, to the extent that you know collectively we could find ways to be able to you know hold temple accountable for its students because the temple police patrol patrol where the students live and so we really need to make sure that we're being um you know that we're we're holding uh, opportunities for folks to vent, but as well as to uh, bring solutions. One of the things that you know I learned from the city is that the the neighborhoods in North Philadelphia and the neighborhoods in South Philadelphia are set up exactly the same way. But when it snows or when trash isn't picked up, South Philadelphia three one one lights up, but North Philly doesn't. And sometimes I think that's because of internalized oppression. People don't think that their their voices matter or they're going to be heard, but also because people think that three one one is a solution, it is not. It's data collection, right? Yeah. Um, and, but then you know one of the one of the ways that we follow up on three one one complaints is we go directly to the source. So we we make that complaint, but then we talk directly to the sanitation department and say, hey, the trash wasn't picked up, right? Yeah. So yeah. that works. But the data collection is important because if the data hit, hits aren't there, then the funding isn't allocated to trash pickup in North Philly, right? That's correct. So, That's correct. So, um, so you know, speaking up and speaking out is something that a lot of times folks don't want to do. They want to either do it through their elected official or they want to do it through somebody like you. And they say, Tyler, can you call this in? Right? And it's like, well, I can do it, but you should be doing it too because I'm one person. But if ten of us call in, then it's a then it make then it's a spike and it'll make a difference. So exactly um, right. so it's it's a I know that neighborhood very well, very well. So um, you know I know that there is uh, there is a uh, is an opportunity for everybody to to be able to get involved in how the neighborhood should be changing for the people that live there now. Yeah, and, and you know, um, Aisha, you know, folks are listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio. Um, this is Leslie Acosta. And, you know, you're on point, Aisha. The, the question is, you know, how do we collectively, you know, get the community and also the uh, university on board where there can be a medium ground of balance, uh, bet- you know, with what the uh, residents want and what, you know, the, the, that because this has been an ongoing battle in that area for a long time. And you know this, Aisha, the community has, the community has given pushback because they don't want that development uh, uh, to go on in their neighborhood because they feel as though if that does happen, property value does go up. Uh, the construction site creates a lot of havoc and people don't want to uh, be, you know, they don't, they don't want that in their community. But right. if it's for the benefit of the community, if it's for the enhancement of that community, then I think there has to be a balance between the university and the community and come to a happy medium to make things happen. Uh, because I think it can, be ben- it can be mutually beneficial for both, for the community and for the university, but the community has to win on this. It cannot be all on the university. And you know that that's the battle. You, we, we can talk about what has right. happened with the Uptown where the university also wanted to uh, take uh, control of that. And, and you know, there's been pushback. So there has to be, there, you have to strike a balance between both. And if you don't have, if, if it's, it's one-sided, you're gonna get pushback and it, it, things will be delayed if you will. Yeah, so, um, I, you know, Tyler, you live, you live in the 16th, in the 16th ward. You know, I, I spent probably, you know, Dec- two decades of my waking hours working in the 16th, um, in the 16th ward. Um, and so, I, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've been trying to influence with Temple is that they created a community development corporation, right? They created folk, they, but they put their own folks on that, on that board. And so they they got a lot of pushback from the community. And because instead of doing something collectively, instead of addressing people's needs and listening to what people's issues were, they decided, well, we're just going to do something on our own, right? We're going to create our own institution with voices that are loyal to us. That doesn't work. And it didn't work. And so they tried to do that Alpha Center at um, 
at uh, um, Diamond and um, at, like it was Broad and Diamond where the Berean church is, right? 13th and Diamond. And right. it didn't get it didn't get the zoning, which then meant meant that they they, they lost their financing, right? Because right. because they weren't being transparent. And so people have a trust issue with Temple. There's also covenants that Temple has signed that hasn't that they haven't fulfilled, like the job commitments for the neighborhood folks for the Leah Corps Center. That that Leah Corps Center, a lot of public money was used for that. And so we know that Temple is a is a hires folks in the neighborhood, but they're not tracking it. Do you know who hires more people from North Philly than Temple? Mm-hmm. Community College. The com- mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me, let me t- t- Tyler and and you made a, a great point, Aisha. And let me just say this. Um, and you know this, Aisha, that you know a lot of money. Even though Temple University is not a state university, it's not a public university. They get public money. They and do. a lot of money and a lot of money from Harrisburg, um, yeah. you know, and and George Kenny, who was a, a legislator, is now the VP of, of government relations at, at Temple University. They get a lot of money. And what what I have my concerns and my dissatisfaction sometimes is that Temple University covers about 100, a, a hundred acres of land. They're in our community. And yet they give back very little to our community. And so George Kenny is a Republican. He's a Republican um, who understands these dynamics very well. So my question to you, Tyler, is, okay, you know, um, what, how, how can we strike that balance? Um, how can it be fair on both sides of the aisle here? Because guess what? The last time I was there, the mo- it was, you know how much money we allocated to Temple? Eleven million dollars to Temple University. How much of that money is going back into the community? And I don't see much movement of that. Aisha, you can attest to this. That was the case. A lot of money does not go back. If they get public funding back into the North Philadelphia area, we don't see much of that. Well, I mean, Tyler, you're a student there. You know what? How 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 involved are you in you know and and having your voice? You're a student and you're a neighborhood resident. How, how involved are you in, in, in decision-making, you know, or in policy? Yeah, uh, I would like to state I've only attended one semester at Temple. So this fall will be my second semester. So I haven't really been there for all that long. Okay. But as a community resident, I am a member of, of the Stadium Stompers. So the oh, Stadium wonderful. Stompers is an uh, organization that's a mixture of both community residents and Temple students, some Temple alma mater and some current Temple students who are against the building of the stadium right in the middle of Philadelphia. I remember when that news first broke, like I think around 2011, maybe, that yeah. basically the plans were almost completely finished. Right. And somehow, uh, I remember there used to be houses at the corner of Broad and Norris, the mm-hmm. all residential houses, people used to live there. And next thing I know, all those houses are gone. And it right. was like an open green space. And then there's word that, oh, there's a football stadium that's going to be built from Broad and Norris down to 16th and Norris. And 15th Street was going to be blocked off forever until Montgomery. And it's like, we didn't hear anything about this. So right. that's one of the positive things that happened because you even have Temple students who are against, you know, the uh, unwillingness of Temple to get involved with the community or even, you know, just ask the community their input. I'm not saying that Temple University has to do things just for the neighborhood because they are a school, but you are an urban school. You should have input with the neighborhood that you're surrounding. It's not like it's University City. It's not like it's Penn State where there's its own city or own area. You are mixed in with community residents. And many Temple students do see that. And I do think a lot of Temple students are more with the community than with the school itself. So yeah, like I said, Stadium Stompers is one of those organizations. And we have actually been very successful. The Temple Stadium has been delayed for years now. I'm pretty yeah. sure the Stadium Stompers did not exist. That stadium will probably be built by now. I, I agree. I mean, I think that, um, that, that, that that project was gonna move forward. And I think that uh, Councilman Clark was gonna approve the stuff, except for the fact that it wasn't just people from the outside uh, com, you know, um, voicing their concerns. It was it was his constituents. It was the people who vote for him. And so he didn't. He he said he listened to the community, and he said no, it's not going to happen. So I think that that stadium stompers is an excellent um, example of how when people rise up, 
and when people collectively use their voices, change happens. And so I just want to lead us into the current pandemic and pandemonium yeah. that we've been yeah. having basically because of this over-policing and, um, you know, the, the militarization, militarization of the police. There are three police forces that, um, that, that patrol your neighborhood. SEPTA, Temple, and the Philadelphia Police, right? You also you got, have PHA Police, too. I'm sorry? And the State Police. And the State P Police. So P four. PHA, Philadelphia right. Housing and Authority. PHA, five, five. Yeah, so five. Five, five. So you have PHA police, you got yep. SEPTA, state police, Philadelphia police, Temple police. Five different police forces are patrolling your neighborhood. And so that's that's a lot, right? It's a lot. And it still takes forever for them to show up if anything bad happens. And, and well, yeah, um, unless it's a Temple student. And then they all show uh, up. Sure, sure. That is sure. Yeah. So, um, so, so, um, but, but we, 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 you know, I mean, we know that we know that, that, that black men are stopped by the police in much higher proportion. Um, you know, we know that the police use tactics, you know, we have a lot of these police that are coming back from Iraq and, and from Afghanistan and they're using war tactics, you know, um, in our neighborhoods. And so tell me, tell me what that, what that, what does that feel like? What does it feel like to live with five different police forces. I mean, yeah, it definitely is over policing. I remember there was a time when PHA, you know, was patrolling my neighborhood. They didn't even have PHA on their cars. They looked just like regular Philadelphia PD. And they were able to jump out and do whatever they need to do without really identifying that they are only Philadelphia Housing Authority police. So yeah, there is, there's definitely a disconnect. There's definitely, you know, I'm pretty sure, and this probably goes for every single neighborhood of the city, but you don't know your local policeman. You probably don't know the captain who's at your precinct. Like, yeah, the police, they have community meetings that you can come to like every last Thursday and voice your concerns. But if it's not the last Tuesday of that month, who do you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely a death. I really believe that policing in a community should be more like a family. You should be able to know the cops who are in your neighborhood. I actually favor more cops walking the beat so therefore, it's not just an intimidation tactic, but it's you get to know who your officer is. You get to know who these people are. Because, yeah, like, honestly, this disconnect causes more police to not know the people in the neighborhood, and it causes them to be a lot more aggressive. And, yeah, it seems to be very militarized, and I'm completely against that because we're not in a war zone. This is North Philadelphia. This is a residential neighborhood. Yeah, of course, crimes happen, but crimes happen everywhere. So, yeah, it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be not be using war tactics that we use on terrorists internationally or residents here who basically we pay their salary to protect us. Yeah, and, and you know, um, Aisha and Tyler, this issue of policing and community, um, it, it's, a, it's a hard issue to talk about because we do talk about it. We have meetings about it. We gather in different places to talk about how uh, to make it better um, and how to facilitate a better relationship. And obviously, you know, in Philadelphia, I believe we, we've made some inroads. We, we still got a lot more to go because the, G, the, G, the GOP, and we have to say this, and not an attack, uh, to, I'm not using this as an attack, but uh, the FOP and the GOP oftentimes um, definitely are in cahoots where they make this relationship at times very difficult to massage through. And if we're going to have a breakthrough in making this better for both the police and the community, we will have better legislation in Harrisburg in regards to uh, adequate policing um, in terms of what type of force uh, these police officers are using when they're arresting people, like what happened in the George uh, 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 Floyd case, we, you know, the death that occurred because of the excessive force that was, that was on this uh, man. So we, we, there's things that we have to get done on the legis on the policy side, on the community side, and then on, in the, in, within the police uh, department to make it better. And if we're not having these conversations uh, with the people that sit at the table and that are making these decisions, we're never going to see this type of police brutality decrease in our communities, especially in black and brown communities because this is where it occurs. And this is not something that's happening now. 
This is had this issue has been occurring, Aisha, and you know this for decades, right. where black and brown communities have been affected by this, are the ones that are targeted by this. There's police profiling in this, and and ultimately this this we have to make better we have to make better policy decisions, um, and, and put them in place to make things happen. And until we don't get that in place, I don't think we're gonna move the needle in decreasing these types of aggression from the police department. The other thing that I wanna say, Tyler, is training. Training at the police department has to be at the forefront of uh, cultural sensitivity is one. Uh, you know, what type of force to use when you're arresting someone. You know, when you arrest someone like they did George Floyd, he was arrested, he had handcuffs. And on top of that, they were beating him in that position. That is unjust, that is wrong. And this is stuff that happens every day in our community and we have to stop this. And I know Aisha was reading some of the uh, articles that you forward about yeah. uh, people coming together and even the police department, there's a consensus uh, in regards to this, um, in regards to reforming um, the culture in mm -hmm. the police department, the culture in the DA's office, which I think we're making progress with the new DA, uh, uh, Krasner, call it what you may, but we've made some progress. And, 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 and you know, you as that represent the Republican Party, I hate to say this, Tyler, and this is not an attack on you per personally, they have to do a better job in instituting policies that benefits the police department, but also the community. And I haven't seen that in a long time. Oh yeah, I don't disagree with you at all. I completely agree with you. First things first is that I care about my community. I care about North Philadelphia. I care about the people who live in my neighborhood. If that differentiates between what the GOP wants to push, then so be it, I am with my neighborhood 100%. And I believe that sometimes you do need an insider inside the GOP to change that. Sometimes you can't always just be on the opposite side yelling at them to change things. So that's the approach that I want to take. I want to be inside the GOP and have a word inside do it. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think that um, that even the police realize that they need to change some of the policies that they have been pushing, like not having a database of uh, of the quote unquote bad apples, right? Mm -hmm. So that folks who are um, who are who have misconducts at, at working at the Department of Corrections don't go into a county sheriff's office or don't go into a um, a county police department. So so having that database of folks who have misconducts in the police in the police forces across our region, across our country, is is important so that we know who 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 shouldn't be hired, who should not, who's not appropriate to be a peace officer, who's not appropriate. Um, one of the other things that um, that um, that the police really need to do is, you know, they incentivize moving. They incentivize that you get promotions when you're willing to move from place to place. So we can only keep a captain in our in our in the 16th district for two years, sometimes even less than that. The, the captains rotate and rotate. We had a wonderful police officer, Officer Muhammad, that used to patrol Broad Street for 20 years. And he did not take um, um, uh, uh, promotions because he wanted to stay in his neighborhood. And he felt like by getting to know the folks on that Broad Street corridor and that 16th Ward, that he not only was able to uh, be an ambassador, but he was also able to translate to his colleagues who people were mm -hmm. and what their backgrounds were. So he served as this connector. We don't have that anymore. We do not know who our patrol officers are. The only time we know them is when we're calling them when something is wrong. And so yep. there does need to be a, uh, a, a, a community policing, you know, particularly in areas where it's, it's uh, where there's over policing is an answer, right? Is an answer to being able to build those bridges so that people get to know who their neighborhood residents are. Um, a, a lot of times you get folks who are, who have mental health issues. And so that you need to have officers that are trained to be able to de-escalate, you know, when somebody has a mental health issue, as opposed to, um, you know, criminalizing folks. So, um, you know, I do want to get to some of the pandemonium because that's not acceptable, right? 
you know, to, you know, making it not possible for our parents to get their medication mm-hmm. by yeah. looting the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the, the pharmacies, um, not able to communicate by looting the phone stores, um, you know, not able to get basic resources like looting sneaker stores. Uh, and then now going back into those places that have been looted and stealing the pipes, that's a problem. You know, yeah. and I think that it's not just it's not just a problem of misbehavior, but it's systemic in that folks, there are folks in our neighborhoods that have never worked have never had a job in the in the in the legal economy. So 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 we have to figure out how can we bring the economic development that has been strangled in right. on Susquehanna Avenue, strangled on North Broad Street. It's been 25 years and we you know my mom has been working on the Uptown Theater for 25 years. And so, you know, that that project was strangled because of democratic folks it was democratic politicians that's true <laughs> let me let's just be clear about that so 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 sometimes we are our own worst enemies right and so i think that you know we need to talk about that we need to talk about the things that we do to each other that 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 make it make it possible for folks on the outside to do us harm yeah yeah and and you know tyler you're you're in a position as a young Republican, you're 22 years old. Um, you represent part of that party. I think you, you, Martina White, who is the chair of the Demo- of the Republican uh, Party GOP in Philly. I think you have you guys have you're in a unique time and place to do right, to do things, to come across the aisle with the Democrats and come up with some. A concrete solutions in terms of policy to 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 do right by the community, and it can be done. Bipartisan support um, and agenda can be done. In spite of your uh, political views, in spite of all that, if people come together, good stuff can come out of that. Um, and 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 we we the conversation has to start somewhere, um, and solutions have to be presented to be able to start working towards uh, uh, those policies uh, that, sh- that should, as you as a black, young black Republican, benefit black and brown communities. So you tell me what currently you're doing with Martina White, uh, what's, the, what's, the proje- what's the solutions um, from Martina White and, your, and, and you and the Republican Party to do this? What kind of solutions are you bringing forth to black and brown communities? Sure. Um, when Martina White was first elected to be our chairwoman after the resignation of uh, Mike Meehan, the first thing she did was come to the uh, black members of the Republican Party and said and asked us, what can we do for you? Because even she acknowledged that the Republican Party has, you know, never really stepped foot in North Philadelphia, never really set foot in black and brown communities, always remain distant. So I do give her applause for that. She has actually acknowledged that there is a disconnect. Uh, and sadly, when this was happening, this is when coronavirus first uh, came over to the US. So we really haven't been able to meet or do that many things in public. But uh, now that the restrictions are loosening up, we are, especially the North Philly GOP, since we are the largest black or, uh, GOP organization in the city, We are planning to have meetings on how to actually combat local injustices. Uh, We want to have workshops. The first thing we want to do is make people in our neighborhood more uh, involved in politics, more politically uh, literate. Uh, That's very the first thing that we can do, let people know what is happening in their neighborhood. So we want to open up these meetings to everybody. Um, Technically, ward meetings are only supposed to be open to people in your party. But since there are almost zero Republicans in this ward, there's only three in my entire ward. I want to open up these meetings to everybody. So like I said earlier, I'm not trying to take this in a political route. I'm taking this more of an activism route because I originally started off as an activist, getting involved with Stadium Stompers and other organizations. So I believe a more activism route, actually speak about the issues that plague our community is the best way to go. I'm not, we are not trying to simply push party politics. We are actually pushing things that are actually concerns and everyday issues for people in the neighborhood. So like I said, coronavirus kind of really put a 
damper on things. We really haven't been able to really mobilize just yet, but we do have a lot of things in the works. Yeah, you know, I also like to um, flip the switch in terms of somebody coming and saying, what do, what do, what can you do for me? Because I think that someone like Martina White coming to you and saying, well, what do you need? No, 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 no. No, I'll tell you what I want. Because, right. um, you know, you're in a unique situation in that you are representing a, a voice that has not been heard in the GOP. And so um, we just had someone who was a very strong voice in the GOP, um, an African-American woman pass away. And I just want to take a little, little time to recognize how impactful she was um, you know, in her, in her leadership. And uh, Renee Moore was a very prominent and she got involved in the GOP as, because she was a business leader. And so, um, but she crossed the aisle, she did, she crossed the aisle. Um, so uh, she had relations, she built relationships, you know, with a lot of different folks and um, she was powerful. You know, she was powerful because as Fred Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without demand and never has mm -hmm. and never will. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, um, that that's a good segue into the conversation with Diana Waters, who just joined the call in that, you know, in order for us to, we have to, we have to deconstruct, right? We, you know, like part of race in America is focused, it focuses in on the other. It focuses in on what are the things that divide us, not what are the things that unite us. And so when we deconstruct, we can, we, we, we power dynamics shift. And so the stadium stompers, the stadium stompers deconstructed. The stadium stompers said, no, we're drawing a line in the sand. You, you know, you're not coming, you're not coming past where you are. You're not going to block off a street in our neighborhood. And that was successful. And you know what? Y'all have to keep your eyes on the prize. Make sure that you continue to keep um, Temple accountable. Because if you don't, then they will slide it through with another generation because it's a, it's a stakeholder institution. It's been there for, you know, since the 1800s. So it doesn't feel like the community is, is as, 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 as strong, but you know, Diana, full disclosure is also my aunt and we're, I'm fifth generation Philadelphia and there's two more generations behind me. So we're not going anywhere. And I think that that's the, that's the, that is the, um, that what, that's what needs to be articulated to Temple. Yes, the community is changing, but the people who have purchased property, who live in this neighborhood, who raised their children in this neighborhood are not going anywhere. And you have to contend with that. Regardless of the, the work that they have been doing to house their students, right? So that gentrification piece is real important. Because as that neighborhood gentrifies, yes, the neighborhood is going to change. And so having a control and a say in how development happens in the neighborhood is going to be critical as well. Right. Right. Uh, we have to take a short break, um, Aisha. Uh, let's go to a short break. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio. We have two guests. We have Tyler. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say what Aisha said I earlier. Tyler Ray, <laughs> exactly, Tyler Ray, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, we have Miss Diane Waters. We'll be right back, and we're going to continue this conversation about race and equality in this country. We'll be right back. We'll take a short break. Yes, uh, we're reporting from Usala Media. We're right here at 5th and Cortland Street. Uh, the CEO and president is uh, Fred Ramirez, and I'm here currently with Juan. Uh, Juan is a committee person at the 42nd Ward, 3rd Division. And he is actually, well, we, we reported this last week, where every Wednesday, now it's Thursday, from this location, they're giving out uh, boxes of greeneries um, for the community. Juan, tell us a little bit about how did you uh, uh, get informed about this and why you think this is good for the community at this time? Well, right now, 
every little bit helps the community, especially with the circumstances that we are in today. So it's just good to see businesses in the community reaching out to the community around them, which is excellent. You know what I mean? That's what we need more of. Welcome back. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usala Radio with your hosts, Aisha Richardson and Leslie Acosta. We're joined by two guests. Uh, we have Tyler uh, um, and we also have Miss Diane uh, Waters. Uh, Tyler is a 22-year-old Republican. He, he's also a war leader in the 16th Ward. Is that correct, Tyler? That is correct. Um, okay. And we also have Diane Waters and the co-host, Aisha. So go ahead, Aisha. Uh, you're, uh, it's a good segue into what we were talking about, race and equality in this country. Given what has happened all over this country, the biggest, uh, I, I would say, in, I, I, in, I, that I can remember, uh, the protest all over this country in regards to what happened uh, with George Floyd, we have race and equality at the forefront right now in this country. Uh, in 2020, we're dealing with this issue of race and equality. Go ahead, Aisha. So we, we wanted to have this conversation because we know that um, there are race and poverty are, are indicators of other um, issues that impact our communities. Um, we know that race impacts whether or not you get a, a, a good quality public education. We know that race impacts whether or not you have quality health care. Um, we know that race is an indicator of whether or not what your um, earning potential is over your lifetime. Um, and so, you know, we are, uh, you know, our communities are, 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 are suffering. And so, uh, you know, we were suffering from the pandemic. We were, we were suffering at higher rates of, of death, higher rates of infection from um, uh, COVID-19. Um, we are suffering from higher rates of unemployment. I mean, across the, the country, our unemployment rates were at 14%. In the African-American community, it was always at 14%. And so, um, and it's it's higher now in the African American community. So, um, so, so we we want to talk about where do we go from here, and you know, how do we have conversations about race that that are that can that confront, but but are also constructive. And so, we brought um, uh, Professor Waters, uh, Dr. Diana Waters, on, um, who is an expert on um, critical race theory, to talk about how do we talk. So. Take it away, Dr. Waters. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. And I just want to take a minute to honor the multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-racial effort for those that have over the past few weeks in the midst of the pandemic, stood up, marched, walked, done everything in the interest of the agenda of equity, inclusion, and democracy. Um, it's been, it's, as Angela Davis um, quotes in, uh, um, in her conversations with um, Nelson Mandela, it's a long walk toward freedom and it's a process. It's not always the kind of, uh, we don't always have to focus and we get distracted by like, what's the end result? But we've been at this for a long time. You know, I wanna frame this by saying, I'm sandwiched in between a generation of people that were ideologically seduced and materially blackmailed into a politics of respectability. And so conversations around race and conversations and framing demands were limited. So I'm sandwiched between that generation and the generation whose um, ideology was represented in a protest sign that I saw a couple of days ago, which was a young African-American woman had a sign that said, 
we are not our ancestors. We will F you up. Um, and after my middle-aged black lady feelings got finished being hurt because in fact, black people and their allies, people of color, BIPOC community folks have always launched ag uh, um, agendas of resistance, always from day one. We've been effing stuff up from the time immemorial. But I wanted to frame that because I want to share with you all that my mantra as a person who spends a lot of time as a bridge, a lot of time between in middle class white spaces with people with, with BIPOC individuals and community members fighting for equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, I know, and this is a critical race theory tenet, that you really can't launch an agenda without having some kind of an understanding of, of that agenda and a way to communicate across difference about that agenda. Um, and so while I eschew, I do not abhor, I just am totally against the kind of PC, the kind of politically correct conversation that helps to keep people out of trouble or helps people seem like really, really woke, you know, that doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, I recently read a Slate uh, Magazine article from, I believe her name is Lauren Michelle, and she was critiquing Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility, which in my mind is a good book and it's a good text for folks that have not been enculturated and have not exp had experience in communities of color. Um, but what, what, but what she's saying, what I'm saying is when you walk into a space and when you walk into any kind of dialogue, um, confessing your white privilege, confessing your complicity in the status quo, that's really not enough. When you walk into a space and the agenda is for democracy and equity and inclusion, and you talk about, righteously so, your anger and your pain, that's not enough. There really is a point at which we do really have to have some kind of forward moving communication that allows people to be uncomfortable, that allows people to stretch, to learn from each other, to be supported. And two, and I'm, I'm, my background is in, 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 in educational leadership and um, uh, this is horrible, I'm a feminist and I'm forgetting the woman's name, it's Ted and Sherry Sizer talk about grappling. They talk about they talk about fighting fear. I'm from the generation where people didn't come out. I'm, I'm, I grew up during the gang warring seventies in, in in Philadelphia, where we gave each other fair ones, right? Mm -hmm. So when I talk about I'm talking about grappling. I'm talking about like you know sometimes in this communication in this conversation again about race, we really do have to have a fair one. Operative phrase fair. It's a fight. It's grappling. Um, and so I also, some of the dialogue, you know, um, you know, I should, you talk about like, where do we go from here? You know, let's be clear. Um, just like, you know, there, there, there was a, a lot of, in the 1990s, uh, during the era of, uh, once again, school reform, the beginnings of the kind of school re reform of the day, there are a lot of workshops around communication across difference. So let's be clear. Some of the communication um, skills and needs across race that are we need today, just like in the 1990s, those communication workshops didn't work in the context when there was an imbalance of, of, of power or you know, particularly on an interactional level, like the threat of abuse or physical violence. Um, or when somebody was not neurologically and intellectually capable of having a conversation. Like the old folks say, if you argue with a fool, you can't tell who's a fool. Um, so if, if both parties don't have at least a baseline interest in honest exchange, it doesn't work. So the conversations that I'm not, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the people that are so scared or so angry or so crazy that you can't reason with them. Um, so here we go. Conversants have to be willing to listen. You have to be able to exercise some kind of a skill in getting heard. And you have to have the ability to withstand a level of comfort without the expectation 
of being taken care of or without the knee-jerk reaction of taking care of other people. What I mean by that is all week I have been in, in, in spaces and in conversations where people that are racially privileged have talked about their pain and their anguish and their sorrow, but it's very clear that they're not conditioned to be uncomfortable. And there was an expectation of being taken care of. People that are racially marginalized, the reaction to that is a resentment and anger of the, because of the expectation of doing that kind of emotional labor. We have to be fair. People that are racially marginalized that have been subject to oppression for these many, many years don't have to play nice. There's something between hostility and adversary. There's something between right. that and playing nice. We have to bring our authentic selves. So if the collective that I'm going to refer to as white people just want to confess their complicity and acknowledge their privilege and just stay out of trouble, that again, that's not enough. But people have to be able to take risks and be supported in those risks, even as we disagree with them or even as we see their limitations. Similarly, if BIPOC individuals or groups enter with the goal of simply unleashing resentment and hostility or provoking or letting others you know, they need to see how it feels. That again, that doesn't work, it's not enough. So one of the things that it starts with is we have to examine our the, the history of America and the West and then examine the impact of those histories on us as individuals and groups. We have to enter the room with some sense of self and some sense of what we're bringing to the table, okay? Everybody can't bring the matches to light the bonfire. Some people have to bring the paper goods um, to the party, okay? Um, sometimes, and it's not everybody's job to do everything. My, my, my father who straddled the line between being an activist and, and having a good government white collar job used to say to us, where he said to me, that if you think of racism as a fire, everybody has a job. And some of us on any given day can only carry a thimble of water, while others of us, it's our obligation to commandeer the fire truck so that we can use the hose. Well, you have to know what your job is, what you have, 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 have the stomach for, and sometimes one of the best communication skills across race is just listening and entering the conversation with where you're coming from. So I often respond to things with, well, as a middle-aged black woman in America, I'm challenged by that. And so I will attack principles without attacking um, people. So you know, it's not about vanquishing the opponent. Okay, so, that, so that's one thing. So we have to ex examine our perspective, our biases, our pain, and we have to make decisions about if, where, and when to enter the conversation. Sometimes it's not our job. Sometimes all we have is a thimble. Sometimes it's not, it's not helpful to be at a, at a particular table at that very moment. Send somebody else in. Yesterday, I sent in my young, I sent in my young white anarchists because I did not have the time, interest, or energy to listen to 60 white people talk about their pain over this. Yesterday was not the day for me. So we had to enter with things like that. The day before yesterday, I was right there with it. You know, educating, moderating, communicating, okay? So you gotta know when, it, when, it, when, it, when and where to enter. Um, um, so, Putting in when we talk about conversation, you know, putting whiteness or putting the black experience into speech is not anti-racist action. Communication across difference in anti-racist faction actually starts with ourselves. Um, and it starts with, with, with taking our inventory of, of, of our own socialization and not being afraid to, you know, there was a time that those of us that are racially marginalized had to circle the wagons and we, and it wasn't safe to disclose vulnerabilities. But at this point, you know, the, we, we, we have a disease and racism is a disease, okay? We have, there are all kinds of disease and I'm gonna frame it like, in, like the disease of addiction, okay? An alcoholic can't just stop drinking without addressing the things that compel them to consume alcohol or drugs or whatever with the obsession and compulsion. Because then they end up just acting out on shortcomings and character defects sober. 
and nobody likes a dry drone. <laughs> right. So we have to get to the root, right? So the beginning of conversations across difference really do begin with an internal inventory. Again, as I said, what do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the party? And sometimes affinity groups do have to do their own work internally to identify implicit and explicit biases in history and how they play out in conversations and policy setting, you know, et cetera. Okay, I already talked about, you know, asking the question, how do we get here? Talking about the, the um, conversation, you know, the, talking about the histories. Uh, Brian Stevenson, you know, um, civil rights lawyer talks about being proximate. We have to be proximate to the people that we want to talk to. We have to go in and out of the bars in North Philly, but we you know what, we might have to go into like, you know, Dauphin County. You know, we might have to go in and out of Trump country and have the conversation and invite them into the democratic run city of Philadelphia. Everybody, it's not everybody's job, but somebody's got to do it. We have to have, we have to have conversation. You don't have to break bread and have tea with the, with the enemy, but our enmity is what takes us down, not, all, not our enemy. Um, those of us that are racially marginalized have every right to be angry and to express that anger in our communication across difference. Um, you know, we have the right to say, as Al Sharpton said yesterday at George Floyd's funeral, get your knee off our neck. You know, Roy Wood Jr., who's a comedian, said something very poignant, which was, I think it was on Seth Meyers on one of the late night shows. And he said, you know, when we talk, we want, if you want to, if you are engaging in conversation and people want to talk about the violence and why are they burning down the stores and things like that, you have to understand that if you have a tea kettle when it begins to whistle, how do you make it stop? You take it off the fire. So we have to turn off the fire. And in those conversations, we have to be very clear I'm going to say this, and this is the, this is the, I think this is one of the main points that is very important for us that are in dialogue. Robert Blauner, and I think this is like a 2010, 2012 article, argues that there are two languages of race. There's the language of we should use goodwill and good behavior and um, niceness and Love has no color and hate has no home here. There's this language of good of, of, of goodwill and good intentions. The Pope. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, often people that are, have white privilege or are white privilege expiring, that's their stand. Then there's the language of practical, um, practical need. There's a language of we want quality daycare, we want we, we want working wage, we want access to housing, we want okay, and so systemic. it's systemic exactly. Thank you. So what we're talking about is we're entering conversations. Some of us are entering conversations on a micro analysis of interaction. I'll be nice to you, you be nice to me, we'll be okay. You know, uh, a demonstrator and cop hug, and now everything is fine. And some of us are entering the conversation of no. You, there are some people that benefit from them and, and participate in the macro level of structural inequality. And what happens is that when we try to have those conversations and I say to someone, you benefit from a system that is inequitable. And they say, but I'm not a racist, that's not enough. Or if someone says, I'm trying to understand my racial privilege and act um, and, and, and tell me what to do. And I say, you know, F you, you benefit from it, get out of my face. What we have to understand is we have to understand these two languages. You have to understand where you're coming from at the time and where your conversant is coming from. You also have to understand that the macro analysis of structure instit and institution bleed into an impact and are impacted by the micro analysis of interaction. Hmm. Macro, so, micro. We want to right. think macro, micro analysis. Where, what, what, what are you talking about? And when you switch between, when you code switch, say so. Be, be intentional about it. And structure interaction. You know, so there, so there are two, there are two, there are two languages of race, and there are also more than just one simple 
when you talk about race, keep in mind, it's a made up ideological ridiculousness that was invented to justify crap, some craziness, some, you know, and, you know, and it's tied to capitalism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Being nice should- is not enough, okay? So I, so I just wanted to kind of talk, talk about, it's not about a how-to manual, it's about how, what you're bringing to the conversation and your understanding of what the conversation is. Yeah, we have about a minute left, Aisha. Um, and uh, you can conclude the show because it's at, we're at 56 and we have the other show coming in, but you can conclude. Yeah. And I tell you, uh, Ms. Waters, excellent information, excellent analysis of this issue of race and equality in this country that we've been dealing with for, for decades now. Um, we've made some inroads, but that uh, uh, this, this situation with George Floyd have set us back. Uh, uh, and we have to have these hard conversations. That's just the bottom line. People don't want to have them, but we have to have them if we're going to move forward. Go ahead, Aisha. So, I, you know, I think that the, the, the most important thing about is, is representation um, and that we need to, diversity isn't just a term. It's not a term that is a, a, a you know, a politically correct term. When you have our major newspaper putting out a headline that said buildings matter, that's a problem because you have our you have a, a, a trusted institution that is practicing structural racism or right? structural structural inequality. And so when but when there are reporters and when there is leadership that is of color, then those folks are able to say and be the bridge to be able to articulate why that's a problem. So this is an issue this issue of diversity, of, of, of inclusion, is something that we need to continue to talk about. We need to continue to, um, to, to advocate for in all of our institutions, whether it's in our medical field, whether it's in our press, whether it's in politics. Diversity matters because we are never going to rise if we don't all rise together. Because guess what? We are in the same boat. We are all in the same boat. Absolutely. So that's what I want to leave everybody with that, you know, our, we, our, our boats rise together or they fall together. And if we don't, we don't acknowledge that, then we have a lot of work to do in terms of understanding what that means. So I, I really appreciate Tyler and Tyler, keep doing what you're doing. I love what you're doing. Um, keep you. being that voice keep being that voice of, of progress in the GOP, keep talking about your community. You know, your community is beautiful. I love North Philly. I love North Philly. I'm, you know, uh, uh, Diana and I are West Philly chicks, you know, but I love North Philly. And so um, Diana, keep doing what you're doing. I love you so much. I, re- I, I you know, you are my hero, you know, um, and, and Leslie, you know, you're amazing. You are just your Phoenix, you know, nothing can keep you down. And, and I think collectively, we can make a difference. So thank you so much for listening to Voices of Change with Aisha Richardson and Leslie Acosta. Everybody stay safe and stay well. Have a great morning. Thank you. Thank you.